Throughout American history, the fear of a president turning into a dictator has always haunted them. From George Washington, to Andrew Jackson, to FDR, and in between, we have Abe Lincoln. Some of the most iconic presidents of all time have been accused of overstepping their bounds. So the question is, quite how close has the US come to having a dictator? Today, many people compare Donald Trump to a dictator, but he's far from the first president to face such accusations. Imagine, if you will, a president who manipulates the Supreme Court, oversteps the term limits, or even suspends key civil liberties. It's happened before more than once. So how close has the US really come to having a dictator? And could it happen again? Let's explore the men who nearly seized unchecked power. Right from the start of the USA, or even just before it even existed officially, people have worried that the USA would be led by a dictator. Exactly the sort of thing they had just fought to get away from. Some of the most famous presidents we know have all been accused. Washington was never comfortable being president for this reason. His direct successor, John Adams, is in the list. Abe Lincoln and FDR too. Here's Patrick Henry giving a speech warning against having a president just as the constitution was being ratified. Can the president, not at the head of his army, beat down every opposition? Away with your president, we shall have a king. The army will salute him monarch. Your militia will leave you and assist in making him king and fight against you. And what have you to oppose this force? What will then become of you and your rights? Will not absolute despotism ensue? We don't have his full speech, as he spoke so rapidly the stenographer couldn't keep up, but you get the vibe. People were suspicious. And after Washington, we move on to the second president, John Adams, who was hated by Thomas Jefferson and his followers. They thought he was trying to make himself king, and with his son, John Quincy Adams, as his heir. But it wasn't strictly true, but old John Jr. did become president eventually. So there's a kernel of the truth there, but not much more. And this is an interesting point. The presidents do occasionally go through dynastic phases. The two Roosevelts, the obsession with the Kennedys, the Bushes, the Clintons, etc. But let's get back to the dictator contenders. The next contender after John Adams is Andrew Jackson. Bit of a scumbag. And I'll make a video on him at some point in the future. But let's just briefly mention that one of the first things he signed into law was the Indian Removal Act that some would consider genocidal. But that's not what we're here to discuss. The TLDR is that he acted a bit like a dictator and vetoed a lot of bills, more than anyone else had before him by that stage. His opponents even called him King Andrew, and a new party, the Whig Party, was created to help get rid of him. And that name, the Whig Party, wasn't random. Some of you may know that the Whig Party existed in Britain, and they were named after them. Why? Well, because the Whigs in Britain wanted less power for kings and queens, and more for Parliament. A lot of people thought Andrew Jackson was very close to being a dictator. There's a big old gap after this. So we'll skip forward around 100 years, until this guy shows up. Yep, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or FDR as we'll call him from now on. What was so despotic about him? FDR comes along and wins in 1933, during the Depression. He starts massive social programs that try to shield people from the harsh reality of it. So far, not so dictatorial, right? Well, the Supreme Court tries to block his laws. So he threatens to pack the court with his judges. And they backed out. So he bullied the Supreme Court a bit, but at times it does seem like it needs bullying. Let's move past that. Then he wins a second election in 1936. So far, so good. Then World War II starts in 1939. The US isn't involved at the beginning. And you probably know that presidents can't rule for more than two terms, right? Surprise, that was only a suggestion for the first 160 years of the US Constitution. You shouldn't do more than two terms. That was a precedent set by Washington stepping down after two terms. But no one could actually stop it. So can you guess where this is going? In 1940, he decides that he can't leave office now of all times and carries on, even though the USA isn't officially part of the war yet. He wins again. Third term, baby. Oops. He's broken tradition, but not the law. Then the USA gets dragged into the war by Japan and Germany. And then in 1944, just before the war ends, there's meant to be another election. He chooses to run again and wins again. He only lasted a few more months before he died. But the president had been set. Four elections won. But now he's gone. People changed the law, so this can't ever happen again. The very interesting thing this story shows is that right at the beginning of the USA, no one was sure how things would work out. And there weren't many official restrictions on what the president could and couldn't do. Each one just tried things until something or someone stopped. 
All of these men have come along since and stretched the rules a little bit, some more than others. And that has continued into the modern day, with the Supreme Court declaring that Trump can't be charged with crimes committed while he was president. So in a way we've reached the peak power of the president. It's kind of like the purge, if you're the president anyway. So we've seen how other people thought about these men and how they possibly were basically dictators or were getting dangerously close to being one anyway. But did any president ever have a chance to go full dictator mode? And what did they do when they had the chance? There are two options here. We have FDR and Lincoln. We'll come back to FDR because we've just talked about him. So let's look at- Okay, Honest Abe, Honest Abe never lied. That's the good thing. In 1862, during the Civil War, a Union general is arrested in the night for losing a battle, but probably because he was helping to capture slaves that had run away from the South. The man behind the arrest is Edwin Stanton, the War Secretary, and he's the potential dictator we're looking at. The next incident is when they need to widen the draft to make sure they can handle this long war. Stanton knows it's going to be controversial, and to stop any protests before they begin, he tells the police to arrest anyone who is against it. He also effectively suspends much of the beloved Bill of Rights. Sounds pretty bad, and he is hated for doing these things. Oh, and he can have you arrested without warrant, and have you sentenced without a trial. For the moment, the United States government lapsed into a virtual dictatorship, with Stanton either exacting punishment without trial, or establishing a trial process in which he could control the outcome. Republican US Marshals took immediate advantage of his order to begin rounding up dissident newspaper editors, judges, and other citizens, or upon complaints filed by other administration appointees and supporters. Many prisoners were dragged halfway across the country for incarceration at Washington, much as British colonial authorities had hauled American defendants all the way to Halifax to answer charges, in the very practice that inspired the Sixth Amendment. So not only is he using more than a bit too much personal power, but he's inspiring loyal soldiers to feel they can take the law into their own hands. And they're doing it. At least 14,000 people are locked up, including a sitting Democrat senator, William Allen. So why don't we know more about Stanton and what he did? It's because he himself realizes he's made a huge mistake, that this is not acceptable and gives up some of his powers to stop the abuse. But Lincoln's reputation is damaged a bit by this. And so he has a small reputation for being a proxy dictator. I guess he did allow it to happen, but no one really calls Lincoln a dictator himself. Back to FDR again. We skimmed over a couple of things earlier. The depression was bad, very bad. And the previous president, Hoover, hadn't done much to help the people. FDR came in promising to help and get the economy going again. He called it the New Deal. Extraordinary times need extraordinary measures. And a lot of laws are passed without Congress really debating them, which looks very suspicious. But little by little, Congress takes more and more control. And a few years later, people look back at that period where what FDR said was gospel, and rumblings of him being a dictator start to pick up. The reality, looking back now, is that if he had been a bit more ruthless, he probably could have taken a lot more personal power. They were strange times. But what stops him being one is himself. He actually cares about democracy. Sure, he used a few shortcuts to get his program done, so in reality he does respect Congress, and so he was never a real dictator. Although let's not forget, he did get elected as president four times, when you were only really meant to do it twice. And speaking of FDR and World War II, watch this to see how it was nearly impossible that the Nazis could ever have won. Against any neighbor, anywhere in the world. In part thanks to FDR. 